everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Charles Frederick Porter Jr. is my guest today on Bump in the Road. Charles's story is a story about personal growth and evolution, about learning to live outside your comfort zone, and it's a story that takes us from his days as a football player at Duke to Hollywood recognition to nearly fatal cancer and beyond. Most of all, it's a story about learning to live a conscious and meaningful life. Please welcome Charles Frederick Porter Jr. Charles, welcome. Um, uh, first, I want to congratulate you on your nomination for LA's Leukemia and Lymphoma Man of the Year. That's a huge nomination. It is. Talk a little bit about <clears throat> it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, the nomination was a huge surprise and honor, of course. Um, a friend of mine who uh, is also a fellow actor in here in LA, he was approached by um, a developed, big developed producer guy uh, for Sony, I think, or whatever production, CBS, sorry. And he talked to him about nominating him, right? He's not a cancer survivor or not a, um, he wasn't a caretaker or anything, but he is a great guy. And so that person felt that he should be nominated for this uh, great honor. And as I find out through the story, he then in turn says, I, you know, this thank you for nominating me, but I know someone who this really, I know someone who really should be nominated for this, that, that's very close to me and that I think would be in line with this type of, you know, campaign, so to speak. And that's how I was nominated. He, he, he recommended me and I met with uh, Adam Sussman and, um, and Kirsten Hale uh, from LLS and, uh, I told him my story and, you know, and here we are now in week four. So it's, it's been quite the, quite the journey from uh, about six months ago. I think the nomination came to now. Tell us a little bit about the story um, behind it, your story. Yeah. Well, so I, 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 uh, we met at a cafe and I, I just, I started in 2000. Actually, I went back. I started with my career in acting and how, after I graduated from Duke University, where I played football uh, for five years, huge part of my life, um, obviously. Uh, I, I was injured my senior year, finished the season. I had back surgery afterwards, and uh, that was the end of my career. I hung my cleats up, headed out to California to pursue a career in acting. Uh, and, and, and in that, uh, I found some success. Uh, obviously, it was a very hard road. Um, it's a challenge to, to, to even attempt to, 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 to just jump into that career at 23. I thought I was starting early, but I was actually 22. But, you know, people have been as curious as their kids. I had no idea. Ignorant to that fact. Um, either way, I had, some, I had some success. And in 2007, I was, you know, getting guest stars on these crime procedurals. I was in a big guest star in House, a big guest star in uh, Without a Trace. Um, I had national commercials rolling. Uh, and then 2009, uh, I was in a five page, you know, Italian men's Vogue spread, uh, with a write up. Things were great. And then 2010, something changed. <laughs> my body was changing. You know, I was calling my mom, who's a nurse. I was, uh, my skin was itching. I was having like, uh, dry skin patches all over my skin. And, um, so she would send me out lotions, you know, still, still, even though you had, I was having success, I was still a so-called struggling, a starving artist, so to speak. Right. I was bouncing around apartment to apartment, um, just making it, but I was happy, you know, young, single, um, kind of good looking, <laughs> but things were in my favor. And, um, and so she would send me out some lotions for the dry skin. Then I was having, uh, I would wake up and literally could splash a puddle splash a puddle so that's night sweats uh, uh and so we thought the comforter was something wrong with the comforter so she sent out a new comforter i'm 30 years old was in the best shape of my life i'm running mountains like there's no way i would ever think that i was sick 
and it didn't get to the it got to the point where about I started dating um Candace who's now my wife um and about three months into our dating <clears throat> she really was like something's got to be wrong because you know she's a girl so she goes to the doctor you know guys don't go <laughs> they could just you know be sick as a dog as I was and just never go to the doctor because we just don't think that way for some reason. And we're just not wired that way for the most part. Um, and finally, after not being able to eat for a week, uh, she rushed me to the hospital in the middle of the night, two in the morning, I was riling in pain in my stomach. And she took me to the emergency room. And um, uh, 15 hours later, I was up in the oncology unit, Cedar cyanide. And then eight days later, I was diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. And all those patches in my ribs um, and all over my body of dry skin were tumors. I mean, I had two broken ribs from tumors. Um, <clears throat> you know, of course, the I mean, dry skin on my neck where tumors were, they literally, and I just didn't find this out until like four years later, I was like two weeks from just being gone. You know, so we celebrated when we found out it was Hodgkin's lymphoma, literally, I think, you know, because I was having people were coming in and out of the hospital room. Um, I think somebody popped a bottle of champagne because we we were we were given the hope that it was a curable cancer. And uh, so, needless to say, after I told that story, um, and the tears were wiped <laughs> from their eyes, uh, they said that yeah, I think that you would definitely be a great candidate. And that's and that's and here we are week four. Well, congratulations. It's a huge honor. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I can't think of anybody who deserves it more. You, you've had so many changes in your life, um, partly as a result of the cancer. I mean, would you have gone into becoming a poet and an author if it had not been for the cancer experience? Great question. I mean, I, you know, I, I think my first real uh, journal entry was when I was 19. And I remember, I, I remember distinctly, I still have the journal, obviously, and I, and I said, you know, I'm writing in my journal today because I'm trying to become the man that I want to be. And uh, so I knew I wanted to be great uh, in some way. I wanted to change the world, make the world a better place. But when I gave the commencement speech at my junior prep school, Rumsey Hall, about five years ago, um, I was digging through some things before I wrote my speech. Uh, and found a report card from my English teacher and from seventh grade. And because uh, Rumsey was seventh, eighth, and ninth. And um, she said, uh, it was a good report card. And she said, you know, JR, they called me JR, my nickname. I'm a, uh, Charles Jr. And then she said, uh, you know, JR has a wonderful way of expressing himself. He should share his poetry more often. So I think the poet was always in me, but taken that creative um, ability or love for, for creating poems and turning them into actual books and authoring books, um, I think truly came about when the time slowed down for me. I mean, I spent numerous days, uh, at one point I spent 30 days straight in the hospital um, when I got my, my stem cell transplant. You know, so yes, cancer changed my life dramatically um, in so many ways. Um, it definitely was the um, the catalyst to to shift my career and my mindset from just being an on screen talent or a model um, to more uh, of the creative side as a writer and a, a creator overall. And the crazy part about it is once I let that go, once I stopped hustling and stopped trying to not, not stop hustling, but once I stopped um, just yearning. So no matter what, every, you know, I, I wanted to get the part. Once I stopped that and released it and, and just dealt with me, parts, movie parts came, you know, it wasn't even about an audition at that point. It was, meeting a director or knowing people in my circle who were creating things, who knew me and knew my story. And that well that I had that just keeps getting deeper and deeper with every, you know, relapse. <laughs> uh, 
you, you have a story to tell because I'm looking at life differently now, you know, looking at the bark on the tree and staring at the bark and wondering, man, this is the, this is the, this is the tree's skin. You know, you don't take those times to think about stuff like that when you're just a 30, you know, 30 year old and everything is great. No, I, I was going through your book, Choose Your Path, and I want to read one of your poems, if that's okay. And in, in the book, the book is just wonderful. It's a reflection on personal growth, societal values and expectations, and how to reconcile them to, to some degree, I think. Um, let me read the poem, and you have some notes after it that I want to read too. The poem is, I am thankful for the day simply because I am. Tattered clothes, tangled hair, nodding out. It could be so much worse. A stroll, a stroll around the canal shows two sides of the same coin. I should not forget this. We have all been through so much. Oh, you'd be rare to escape life's pain. But pain can fuel life. One day there will be no more, so I must remain thankful. And you have some notes that follow it. And the notes read, walking through life at one point, thinking there was no end. When I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, my compassion and empathy intensified. That is when I truly started to love myself, and I just truly started to believe in myself. Once I knew nothing is forever, I truly started living, grateful to be alive. And I love that once I knew nothing is forever, I truly started living. Um, I, I think it goes, this is one of the things I ponder. I, I think that we don't know for example, the joy and the love of life until we know that it's limited. We don't know hot until we know cold. Yeah. Um, what are your yeah. thoughts? I, mean, <clears throat> Man, I haven't read that one in a while. That was, uh, I know exactly what I was doing, that tangled hair and tattered clothes. So you could be living in a $4,000 a month um, uh, apartment um, off the canals uh, or the, um, the bay by the beach. And homeless people are lying the streets, you know, and most people will just walk past and that's just a fixture on the ground. And I try to, I carry a bag of clothes in my car all the time, all the time. And if I see someone without shoes or in a situation where I feel like the, my clothes will fit them or I have what they might need. I, I give it to them on a regular basis. I mean, yes, I, I was moving so fast in my third, you know, up for, from my, from, since I was born to my thirties and before I was diagnosed that, you know, just trying to get to that next thing, just trying to get to that next thing and was missing the things that I had. Um, a pro, a, you know, a classic example, I'm at a neighbor's house. She's got a beautiful yard of diff, all raised of, of plants and, herbs and this and that and you know she wanted to show me the next plant before I could even appreciate the the yellow flowers that were blooming right here in front of me and then she even said oh I'm sorry I'm going too fast you know we're all going too fast trying to get to that next thing when like the alchemist it could be the very thing right here in front of us that gives us all the joy that we need you know but we need to go on that journey we need to go on that journey. And that's what choose your path is all about is, is really choosing your journey, you know, taking your path. I mean, cause you're, you're, you're one of a kind. We, we all are, are, are all one of a kind and we all have a, a story to tell and whether it's a cancer diagnosis or an abuse or a loss of a loved one, you know, that's life. And we can learn from those, those challenges and that uh, adversity. And uh, I promised myself that from the jump when I first was diagnosed that I'm not going to let this destroy me or be a burden. I'm going to, I'm going to just be thankful and try to create the, the most of all the moments that I'm given until the rest of my days. And that's what that poem is really about. And I love that poem. Uh, and as I, you know, as I was talking about the bark on the tree, that's a prime example. I mean, who walks past the tree and looks at the bark? I actually, I have a, an amazing tree outside of one of my windows right now. And I did, I took a picture of the sunlight on the bark recently. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll send it over to you. Um, it'll probably be up on my Instagram account. It was so stunning. Amazing. 
it was just so beautiful. I, I couldn't, I couldn't not capture that moment. That's right. That's right. And you are, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows a fellow cancer, uh, you know, destroyer, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and that's what I like to call it. I don't say survivor, you know, we're out here uh, destroying it. And, um, and that's a mental thing. That's a mental and a spiritual thing when I say that. I don't, I'm not trying to be um, braggadocious or, or, or cocky about it. It's just, you know, when you're, when you're faced with cancer or you're faced with a diagnosis of any kind that could have a, uh, I mean, death, you could be facing death. Understand that and then losing the fa- losing people that I've loved and still feel in their spirit that, you know, you never truly die. It's just your body is gone, but I still feel my father who I just lost in October. I see him in Hawks. I see him. I feel him. I feel his spirit. I, he lives through me. And um, so I just try to make the best of every day. And my interactions with people, I, I, I really take my time as the, as the most uh, valuable commodity that there is. Don't, don't you think part of life is learning to develop your, your compassion? I mean, it, you know, it's so crazy. And I'm, and I'm not kidding about that. I go back to that, that when I said I'm writing in my journal to be, to try to become the man that I want to be. You know, you, when they say you need to be careful what you ask for, this is a prime example. I literally prayed to the universe and to God to be more compassionate because I was on, I, was, I had a one track mind. I'm out here in LA on a mission and anybody in my way, I'm just going to bulldoze over and I need to get, 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 get. And so the compassion went out the window. Oh, you don't really want to do work. You don't, you're not about your business. You're not about work or I can't, we can't do business together or I can't, you can't help me get to the next level to be honest. And, you know, see you later. And I literally told, but a friend of mine told me, he said, you literally told me you're not trying to make friends out here. You're just trying to work. And then when I asked to be more compassionate, you get a diagnosis like I got, (laughs) I mean, it took that. You know, college, I mean, I was a, I was an athlete all through my years. And so you can only imagine, and a very good one. And as we know in the society, um, if you're a gifted athlete, uh, there are allowances made. And sometimes those allowances can warp your reality of what life is really all about. And you kind of just keep stepping over people or around people and not seeing what's really going on. And then you hit and then it hits you like, oh man, I've been missing out all these years. And so you don't, you don't I don't have regrets, but I'm, I'm very thankful that what happened to me has allowed me to kind of take stock and reassess and, you know, attack life in a different, in a different format. You've lived several lives and one of the things that strikes me is you have learned to live outside your comfort zone in many ways. That's not always easy to do. It's not. And like some people go to the gym and work out their physical bodies. Um, I think I take pride in working my mind that way. And I read many books and I have mentors and I have, um, round tables of, of, of friends who I uh, admire and who are successful in business and in life and as a, as a family, family men and women. And, you know, a common thread is that, you know, you have to be uncomfortable in order to grow, you know, uh, in the, in the nature world, uh, shedding of skin, um, changing your shell, uh, you know, you, if you're not growing, then there's no need for that type of stuff to have to happen. But if, if you're growing, then that's just the way that that's just the way nature is. You have to shed some of the person that you were, or that, you know, in order to get to the person that you're trying to be. And so, yeah, I, I, I do put myself in uncomfortable positions. I mean, even taking this challenge 
uh, is uncomfortable for LLS because, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And I, I set out to, to, to raise a, a lofty amount at $250,000. And, you know, my first idea for doing that was actually to get 250,000 people to raise a dollar. And I thought, I, I, like I mean, that. I thought how easy would it be to ask someone for a dollar? I mean, I give $5 all the time to certain things that I believe in on Facebook just because I, feel I have $5 and I believe in it. A dollar would be even easier, but the charity is a charity, but there is a business format behind the charity and they have many, many wonderful people working for them who have fantastic ideas. And before COVID hit, we had this thing called charity buzz and you could put like a three night stay in a villa um, with X, Y, and Z included. And that can go on the charity bus and that would go however much people, you know, bid on that, on that prize or that experience that goes towards your raise. And so I had things, you know, I have a friend of mine is the head photographer for the Yankees. She's on my team. I have, you know, ex football and um, pro athletes. Uh, I had all this stuff set up and then COVID hit, but you know what? Cancer doesn't stop. So that, so they pushed the time back as far as with the raising, but it's still during the time of COVID. So we would already, we would have already been done had this just been no COVID. So they pushed it back about a month or so. And now I'm in week four instead of at week 10, but still trying to raise that amount of money with, uh, half the team, you know, I had a team of 10. Two of my teammates' uh, fathers passed away during this time. Then you have COVID. So it's an uncomfortable situation. But I have never quit tattooed on my back. My team is called Team Never Quit. I made a commitment to LLS. And as much as I want us to quit and say this is impossible, I think we're now up, we're now have raised up and uh, we're almost at $20,000 in four weeks. And that's with not even half my team. So some of the teammates are starting to jump back in. Um, we have six more weeks and we might not get 250, uh, but we will, we will contribute to a, a great cause, a cause which I didn't know until I was nominated actually um, contributed greatly towards the, uh, the um, trial I was on with immunotherapy and nivolumab. And that's now a, a FDA approved drug. So I'm, basically thanking them for saving my life. Oh, big time. <laughs> uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is one of those amazing charities. They really funnel money into areas that help people directly. Um, I, I just, uh, I think so highly of Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tell me, if you could rewrite your story, would you? No way. No way. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's been a really good life. It's been a really good life. Um, I have, <clears throat> you know, you have to think about when people sit down or when I sit down, I think about what do I really want out of life. Um, at this age, normally the first answer is peace. And what does peace mean? To me, a solid foundation of a home, safe home. Uh, I'm a father of two daughters. Uh, one is will be three next month. The other one just turned seven months. I have a, a, a wonderful wife who's supportive in my dreams and my goals and who, who obviously who saved my life for the most part, who took me to the hospital, forced me to go that, that night to the emergency room. It, you know, like, like you mentioned earlier, I've, I've had many different path my my journey has 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 veered left and right and up and down i'm i've climbed mountains uh mount rainier twice uh i've traveled the world you know what what i was always trying to become and get in life as a child i think we all have these 
inner uh, uh, desires and, and aspirations, um, they're 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 coming into fruition. So, what would I take back? Um, nothing. <laughs> I mean, I'm learning every day, and that's the goal. I want to become better than I was the, yesterday. What what advice would you give somebody facing their own bump in the road? I'm sorry? What advice would you give somebody facing their own bump in the road? Feel it. Feel that bump. Let it let it affect you. Get uncomfortable with it. But also let it allow it to build and fill this fill in a, a, a hole that that bump has has put into your life that's going to also feel, you know, and it's 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 like the the scientific uh, you know matter can never be created nor destroyed. Well, your that bump is 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 a hole. Like if you lose someone, a loss of life, or if you're diagnosed with cancer, it's going to fill a hole in your gut. But it's, that hole is going to have is going to now need to be replaced with something, and that could be replaced with uh, a stronger, uh, more uh, having more appreciation for life. Um, it can build courage. It can build because you now it, you can inspire others who are also going to, I mean, I'm a coach. I'm a fitness and life coach because I had a bump in the road. I had a one track path to being a movie star. And then all this other cancer happened. And now I'm a, uh, a published author and a fitness and life coach with a you know, great career, a father, um, a husband, you know, all these things that... <laughs> To be honest, when I was before I got sick, I, I just thought I was going to be single for life. And just that would have been my journey. But that's not what I saw when I was a kid. I saw other things that I was trying to aspire to be and become. And, and it kind of sometimes a bump and road can feel like it's knocking you off track, but it actually knocked me back on track. And so if you're facing your own bump in the road, One, understand, and this might not be consoling for some, that you are not alone. You are not alone. And two, this uncomfortable feeling, this pain, this, this confusion, this heartache, whatever this bump is, time heals all things. And I'm saying that as a stage four stem cell transplant, three, ra three relapses in, just lost my father. I'm telling you, time heals all things. Charles, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing me to share. You know, every time I tell my story, uh, a little less trauma, traumatic or a little less trauma, you know, kind of sheds off. Um, because it's a traumatic experience for sure. It is. Um, but I think that in sharing our, our tra traumatic experiences and being real about mm. them, I think it is so incredibly inspiring and helpful to other people because we all hit points where we, we don't think we can go forward. We want to quit right. and you, and you can't, but it's easier said than done. It is. It is. And I get that. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I'll leave you with this. Uh, day three or four of a process, uh, I had five days of twice a day, full body radiation. By the third or fourth day, you can literally feel the waves through the air. And I remember they used to wheel me <clears throat> under the hospital because I couldn't go outside for 30 days, couldn't see people for 30 days because your immune system is completely obliterated. And I remember they wheeled me back up to my room. My mom was there. I said, mom, I had a good life. I just can't do this anymore. And that was the time when I really, that's the only time where I really felt like quitting. And she said, just one more day. 
And no matter how many more days there were after that, if you just take it one day at a time, one step at a time, one moment at a time, I mean, here I am 10 years later speaking to you guys. So never quit. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.